He was born in the Golden Age into a family of wealth and influence, but chose the Army as a career and way of life. Brilliant, inventive, and outspoken, he enlisted as a private to fight in the Spanish-American War, arrived in Cuba as a lieutenant in the Signal Corps, and emerged as the youngest captain to serve in the Army at that time. He taught himself the basics of aeronautics from a book and became the leading exponent of air power to a reluctant general staff. Promoted to Brigadier General in less than 20 years, his meteoric career collapsed after he charged the military and civilian command of the nation's defense with negligence and ineptitude. He predicted the First World War with Germany, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and even an age when planes would fly at a thousand miles per hour. His foresight and outspokenness won him both a general court-martial and a special Medal of Honor. His name is Billy Mitchell. He was tempestuous, he was controversial, he was outspoken, he occasionally acted intemperately, but it was Billy Mitchell who gave to us the vision of modern global aerospace power that we have today. That is why Billy Mitchell is a legend of air power. William Mitchell was the grandson of a Scottish immigrant banker, Andrew Mitchell, and the son of a United States Senator, the reform-minded Democrat John Mitchell of Wisconsin. Billy Mitchell was a college junior of 18 when the Spanish-American War was declared in 1898. He heard the news, decided to enlist, and took the train back to the family home in Milwaukee to join the Wisconsin Volunteers. After completing his basic training with the Wisconsin Militia, he was shipped out to a staging area in Florida where he was called to active service with the U.S. Army and offered a commission as a second lieutenant in the Signal Corps. By the time he arrived in Cuba, most of the fighting was over, but he impressed his superiors with his industry. He taught himself the entire code system of the Army, taught himself Spanish, and even typing to improve the appearance of his reports. By 1901, he was promoted to first lieutenant and sent back to the States for a series of assignments taking him to Alaska, Virginia, Colorado, and finally back to Virginia in 1904. He was now the youngest captain in the Army, eager to learn all he could of the new emerging technologies, radio, submarines, and airplanes. He met Orville Wright in 1908, when Wright was preparing for Army tests at Fort Myer, Virginia, where Mitchell happened to be stationed. While Mitchell did not actually witness the flights, he was impressed with the potential of what he saw. everything he could find on aviation. In 1914, Mitchell wrote a paper for the command college envisioning the possibility of invasion and attack by hostile patrol vessels and aircraft. In 1915, Mitchell took flying lessons, four of them before soloing. Now 36 years old and a newly promoted major, Mitchell was made head of the Army's aviation section in Washington. He began studying other nations' air forces, making particular notes on Germany, France, and Japan for their advanced aircraft development. By 
1917, Mitchell believed the United States could no longer avoid becoming involved in the war in Europe. Both sides were hopelessly stalemated in trenches on the ground. American volunteers were flying with the French army in a unit called the Lafayette Escadrille, but tactics were almost non-existent, and the death rate was appalling. Mitchell finagled an appointment as an observer with the French army. One week after his arrival, German U-boats sank the liner Lusitania, and the United States, completely unprepared, entered World War I. Despite promises of thousands of American-built planes, the United States had almost no pilots to fly them. Flight school consisted of 50 hours of rudimentary training, often with disastrous results. So the peacetime nation began the process of building airplanes out of cloth and wood. Designing easy to assemble aircraft which were tested then disassembled and packed in crates for the long voyage across the Atlantic. In the next six months, Mitchell was promoted to full colonel and given command of U.S. Air Forces assigned with the 1st Army. Mitchell believed that air power demanded special persons to be pilots, and he actively recruited those he felt demonstrated the right qualities. One of them was a young chauffeur attached to General Pershing's staff. He'd already established himself as a race driver in the States before the war, and so Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed Hat in the Ring Squadron became a flyer, an ace fighter pilot instead of a driver. But there were still no American planes to be had. Mitchell struck a deal with the French. If they would give him the planes, he would fly American pilots against the Germans. On Sunday, April 14, 1918, Mitchell gave the order to launch patrols against reported incoming German aircraft. Two American pilots took off and in less than two minutes engaged the Germans. Two minutes later, both German planes had been struck and their pilots bailed out. By July 1918, after four exhausting years of warfare, both sides were reaching levels of desperation. While the French and British control their sections on the ground, the Germans control the air. Attempts to send up observation planes only brought a swarm of a dozen German fighters eager to send them flaming to the ground. The Americans devised a counter strategy. Observation airplanes were escorted by as many as 50 American pilots. Now in the summer of the fourth year, the Germans made an all or nothing assault on the French American lines near San Miguel. 70 German divisions crashed against the Allies and buckled the front lines. Mitchell recognized the Germans would throw thousands of airplanes into the fight unless he beat them to it. He ordered 1,500 planes to be readied and actually launched 1,481. He attacked the German supply lines, cutting the troops off from behind and trapping them between Allied ground forces and his massed pursuit planes and bombers. In the four days of the offensive, American flyers made 3,300 flights over enemy lines, dropped 75 tons of explosives, and destroyed 60 German aircraft. Based on his success in smashing the German offensives and coordinating air and ground units, Mitchell was promoted to Brigadier General in October 1918. 
He was drawing up plans for a new combat contingent. Armed with machine guns, these special infantry units would parachute into position from bombers designed to carry a dozen or more men. The war ended before Mitchell could try his idea. It would be another year before it was tested by one of his junior officers, a young major named Hap Arnold. With the victory of Allied forces came a prayer from the public that such a war, with such terrible losses of human life and weapons of destruction, never be allowed to happen again. Many called for the elimination of the army, the destruction of the navy. Aces like Rickenbacker were shown by the newsreels, trading in their uniforms for new suits to pursue peaceful careers. Some of the flyers took up barnstorming, demonstrating the skills they had learned in combat to thrill crowds who gathered anywhere the sound of an airplane engine could be heard. Mitchell returned to Washington and the War Department as the acknowledged expert on military aviation. But those who commanded the Army and Navy felt that aviation was still just an adjunct to artillery and battleships. The service heads joined with powerful groups in Congress to effectively wipe out the aviation units in favor of more conventional weapons. Without realizing it, they began a battle which would last longer than the war itself and cost Mitchell his career. It was Billy Mitchell who first recognized in this country that the stakes of warfare had changed, that three-dimensional forces, those operating in the atmosphere and those operating below the surface of the sea, would hold two-dimensional surface forces hostage. And he paid with his career for his outspokenness in championing that view. In the spring of 1919, Mitchell wrote an article in which he predicted, the Atlantic is going to be crossed, and within short times, we shall have regular airplane mail transportation between America and Europe. We no longer measure distance by miles, but by time. The commercial traveler, henceforth, will read the new air timetable and find that Chicago is four hours from New York, or Los Angeles is 28 hours from Boston. To prove his points, he launched the first transcontinental air reliability contest of Army aircraft from New York to San Francisco. Deputy Director of the Air Service, Mitchell focused his energies on convincing the Congress of the value of his vision, that air power would soon overrun that of the Navy's warships and Army's ground troops. His vision was made public in congressional budget hearings, where he testified and laid out his challenge. All we want to do is have you gentlemen watch us attack a battleship. Give us the warships to attack and come watch. A furious Navy secretary, Josephus Daniels, replied that he would stand bareheaded on the deck of any battleship Mitchell tried to bomb. The test began June 20th, 1921, off Hampton Roads, Virginia. One by one, over the next month, Mitchell's planes targeted and hit mothballed American and German ships. And, one by one, they sank. The final attack was against the German battlecruiser Ostfriedland on July 21st. Largest of the German dreadnoughts, she had already survived a combined torpedo attack and salvos from British battleships in World War I. The American and German navies considered her unsinkable. 
Mitchell's flight of bombers sighted and dropped their payload. They placed the bombs around the ship, crippling the battleship's hull. It took less than four minutes and four bombs. Ostfriesland rolled and went down. Mitchell next led a flight of Martin bombers against the retired U.S. battleship Alabama. With General Pershing and other Army and Navy officers looking on from the transport ship San Miguel, the air group sent the ship to the bottom. of the bombing test did not spell the end of Mitchell's troubles with the Navy and War Departments. In fact, it made things worse. Despite promises from the new president, Coolidge, to create a unified military department and support for expanding the Air Corps, nothing happened. The Army and Navy kept their individual departments. In 1925, Mitchell was reverted to his permanent rank of colonel and transferred from Washington to Kelly Field as air officer. Others who had supported him, like Hap Arnold, were also reduced a grade in rank. Following a pair of air disasters in September 1925, Mitchell issued a press release which said, the accidents are the result of incompetence, the criminal negligence and the almost treasonable administration of our national defense by the Navy and War Departments. On October 3rd, 1925, Mitchell was ordered to be court-martialed. The trial lasted weeks, and Mitchell continued to be blunt with the court and prosecutor. Prosecutor, you say that in future wars, soldiers will invade by leaping in parachutes from airplanes? Would you care to reveal who gave you this startling information? Mitchell, nobody gave it to me. It's quite obvious to anyone with the slightest foresight. Is it your actual belief that the country is vulnerable to attack from the air in the foreseeable future? Colonel Mitchell, do you have any idea of the width of the Atlantic Ocean? Approximately 3,000 miles. And the Pacific Ocean? I know what you're getting at, and I tell you that it won't be long before airplanes will fly non-stop across both oceans. You say that airships traveling 1,000 miles an hour will fight each other in the stratosphere? Do you have any comprehension how fast 1,000 miles an hour is? Of course I do. Do you know it is faster than the speed of sound? Approximately 250 miles faster than the speed of sound. You say that the Hawaiian Islands, our base at Pearl Harbor, will fall victim to an air attack? Does your crystal ball reveal by what enemy this mythical attack will be made? By whom, Colonel? By whom? The attack will be made by the Japanese. The court found Mitchell guilty of insubordination and suspended him from rank, pay, command, and duty for five years. Billy Mitchell resigned from the Army and retired to his farm in Virginia. Now a civilian, he continued his campaign for a separate Air Force Department and unified command under a Department of Defense. He met with old friends and supporters and spoke and wrote constantly to the public. But in 1936, the wear of the years and campaigning finally took Billy Mitchell. He died February 19th in a hospital in New York. December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, launching their planes from aircraft carriers, just as Mitchell had predicted. 
America's first aerial assault against Japan was led by Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, flying the B-25 bomber named after Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell fought with distinction in two wars. He set a world speed record and proved beyond question that his vision of the future for the nation and his beloved air service were correct. Though a thorn in the side of those he considered mossbacks for failing to be innovative or intelligent, his voice and vision reflected his love of country. What Mitchell did was he lit a fire that burned within the hearts of air power advocates after him, people like Hap Arnold, Tui Spots, and their successes. And his example, uh, I think, should be with us to the present day. He is a revered figure and should be as long as this Air Force continues to exist. On July 18, 1947, two months before his dream for the United States Air Force was finally made a reality, a special act was passed by Congress promoting Billy Mitchell to the rank of Major General retroactive to the date of his death. It was, finally, recognition of the contributions to his country by this legend of air power.